Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for a behind the scenes look at the Canadian Maple model, which is essentially an investment model defined by the leadership of the Maple 8 pensions. Uh, pensions in Canada, including AIMCO, BCI, CDPQ, CPP, OMERS, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, and PSP, and now replicated by several others, not only in our own fair country, but also across the globe. Um, I'm honored to be joined by three of these esteemed pensions here today, and we'll look into uh, what makes this pension model still so successful, and whether there's are, are potential risks given the market environment. So the Maple model is essentially defined by several elements. There's strong independent governance with arm's length from the government and all with professional boards. The Canadian pensions were first movers uh, many decades ago in making material private market allocations and still to this day all have high allocations to alternative investments with some sitting at over 50% across all asset classes. To do this, they've invested in top talent in-house while also using external managers, and they have boots on the ground in multiple key cities across the globe. They're also very well compensated, of course, to re retain this top talent in-house with a focus, of course, on DE&I. And finally, all of this is to deliver to their stakeholders long-term patient capital with sustainable returns. So let's dive into this model a little bit further, um, and I'll start with you, Edward. What element of this model of investing remains still relevant to this day? So, Claire, I think it's important to realize that the, uh, the Maple 8, or the Canadian model, is related to the public pension plan. So there's always a government sponsor behind it, whether it's the federal or the provincial sponsor. Um, so what is actually very important and which was put in place from the very beginning 25 years ago is that the sponsor has no impact on or no direct say in, in the investment strategies. So they're really at arm's length and that creates a lot of freedom for the Maple A to really look for, for value add and look for innovation without any interference from the sponsor. And I think that's a very crucial element in the model and that should stay actually in place, you know, for the years to come. Okay. Brandon. Um, yes, thanks. So I think that's just a given and fundamental to how the, the Canadian pension model works and without that arm's length nature, it would be, it, it wouldn't work as well. Um, I might speak myself to the, um, the sort of combination of using external managers and internal strategies because that's something that I work very closely with. So in my role, I invest in external managers, but um, work really closely with internal teams as well to create sort of seamless benefits between the two. So in my case, um, you know, we reach out to lots of external managers in the hedge fund space and other, other areas, and we try to garner as much um, sort of strategic benefit from those relationships as we can, and we call that relationship alpha. But, you know, we're a smaller team. You know, even though it's a big organization in AMCO, we're a, you know, of a certain size, and we can really just benefit from these large teams that some of our partners have, and we can, you know, just really use that talent to make ourselves better and more knowledgeable, better at what we do. And at the same time, I work alongside these internal teams, and what they really bring is the ability to be flexible and risk managed. So we might be working on some stuff with external managers here, but we're going to hedge it with an internal strategy or you know, build something very nimbly and quickly that can really offset a risk or give us an opportunity that we might need quickly. And we also sort of mix the external people with the internal people so that we can make the, the internal teams better. So all of that really um, makes us you know, just able to garner more alpha and, and manage our risks better. And I think that's, that's a really important aspect. Thanks, Brandon. We're going to dig in more to external manager highlights uh, later, but Puneet, what element stands out to you making the Maple model still so successful? Well, I think, I think the points that everyone uh, touched on here were, are important. Uh, you know, strong board, experienced board, strong governance, um, the use of internals versus externals to kind of fill the gap, but I'd focus probably on um, compensation. I think early on, the Canadian model focused on paying top dollar for top talent. 
uh, on par with kind of the peers or competitors that you'd have in the space in terms of getting that talent, which would be your banks, your hedge funds, other asset managers. So really figuring out that you wanted, in order to have top talent, to get top class, world class returns, you have to pay for that and make sure you invest in your people and have that sustainability for the long term. Okay. Um, given that we're at Global Alts, I uh, would love to get a flavor of where you're allocating generally uh, two alternatives in your asset allocation mix. Edward, maybe you can walk us through um, what PSP sure. looks like. Yeah. So it depends a little bit on your definition of what alternatives are, but in our case, and to keep it very simple, we make a distinction between public markets and private markets. Um, so you could argue all the private markets are alternatives. Uh, that's a very broad definition, but if you take that distinction, then it's roughly 45% in publics and 55% in, uh, in private markets. And the private markets consist of natural resources, real estate, infrastructure, private equity, and private debt. Now, within the public uh, piece, there's also the allocation to hedge funds. Um, that is another few percent of, of our overall allocation. So if you take this very broad definition, we are uh, invested roughly 60% in, uh, in alternatives. How does this compare to AIMCO, Brandon? So it's a bit different for us because we have about 16 clients um, and all of, and we have within those that we have multiple accounts and every one is a bit different. So it's really gonna depend a bit on what they need and we have everything from endowments, you know, that are structured in a certain way to, you know, more trust oriented to sort of pension plans. So everybody is a little different so I won't be able to answer that in the same way. Um, but we do provide access to everything that Edward just described. So everything from private debt, private equity. I, uh, my team manages the hedge fund and portable alpha strategies and we definitely wanna give our clients access to all of those strategies and they decide where, how much to allocate. Great. Yeah, uh, so it's an important distinction. For, so for those that don't know, the, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, we're about 250 billion. Uh, we service about 300,000 active and retired teachers over, over that actually. 80% of our assets are managed internally, but we use the external programs to kind of fill that gap yeah. to access either regions where we may not have the expertise at the current state or, or sectors that we may not also have the expertise in as well. We just recognize that we can't do everything internally. Um, so the program that is under my uh, purview is uh, the external managers groups within public markets, and that represents about 9% of the fund's assets. Uh, we're probably concentrated more so than other plans in terms of in, in multi-strats and relative value rather than global macro. So we're trying to really garner that alpha cash plus type of returns that will generate orthogonal returns different from equities and bonds or traditional asset classes in kind of any market environment. And maybe beyond asset allocation, another area where Canadian pensions have taken the leadership is in total portfolio approach. Um, Edward, how do you think about implementing total portfolio approach across what you're investing in? Yeah, I think the, the Canadians really went through a, uh, a bit of a journey. So the model itself actually the, you know, was started in the, in the you know, N90s, so it's 25 years ago. But then, of course, um, you know, most of the funds started to invest um, slowly in private markets, in real estate first, and then in infra, et cetera. So over the years, they started to build up all these different pockets of, of different asset classes. Um, and basically, what they tried to do was come to a, a minimum allocation. But I think the last couple of years, uh, most of the Canadians really started to think about the total portfolio uh, perspective like how can we best manage all these different pockets in light of the liability structures that we have. Um, so in our case, uh, we did the same, and then roughly five years ago, we really started to think carefully about like what is the role that every asset class actually plays in the, in the total fund? How does it link into uh, the liability structure? Um, and then you come up with a definition like infrastructure is very interesting because of the the long duration it brings, it's interesting because of the index, the, the inflation index that it can provide. And so every asset class has a very specific role to play in the, in the total funds. Um, and the combination of everything is really to keep basically the returns at a high level, but also make sure that you do not enter in a, in a deficit for the plan. 
So that's the way how we think about total fund management and how we play with the different asset classes. And we're always looking for new asset classes or new strategies to, to optimize this, this whole set. Of course. Um, and part and parcel with total portfolio approach is uh, the concept of strategic partnerships or strategic relationships and really engaging with managers uh, across asset classes and across strategies. Brandon, can you talk a little bit about how you've used strategic relationships? Sure. So, um, in fact, in my former job, the the title, I was doing the exact same job investing in external managers, but it, the, the title of the job was, you know, strategic partnerships and innovation, you know, because they really wanted to just cement the idea that the uh, one of the main, you know, sort of reasons for having this, these external partnerships was to really partner with them. And in our team, it's called external partnerships as well. And that, that really matters um, because what I think, you know, pretty much every investment that we make externally, we try to figure out, you know, where can we work together? What are the superpowers of this particular organization versus that particular organization? And can we, how can we benefit and work together? And maybe we can also benefit them, and the one plus one equals three really helps everybody. So, um, so, so we've literally partnered with people just on day-to-day, -day, you know, minutia of, you know, how do we make our trading strategies better? To very big picture, um, big picture conversations. Whether it's how are we going to do strategic asset allocation at the total portfolio level? Um, we talk about macro ideas, et cetera, and just talk about, you know, bring bring some. You know, if we're working with an organization that's just very tapped in with governments and central banks, et cetera, we want to bring that information in. Um, and it can really span anything and everything. And we've even used it for things like H HR questions. So, so we happen to have a partner, I remember, um, who is just really good at hiring diverse talent. And um, you know, we were, how do they do this? And we've sat with their team, and they helped us rewrite our ads and do all kinds of things. So every organization can help in a very different way. And I think if you can figure that out and just assume that you can lean on them um, and work seamlessly. It actually, uh, you know, it all sort of passes back to the organization. So it, it's definitely worth it. Absolutely. What makes an external manager stand out such that they might rise to become a strategic partner? Edward or Pani? Uh, sure. I mean, we look for long-term strategic partners. Uh, we value openness, transparency, obviously returns. Um, but we, we want to also share information, as, as you said. We're looking to, we're open in terms of information that we're willing to share, uh, but we also look to our external partners to make us better. Uh, that can take, in, take the form in, in various avenues. It could be trading related, it could be DNI, uh, it could be board ed education on inflation or commodities. Um, this, the scope is really un unlimited, so we'll tap into where we can to kind of make ourselves better. I think, Claire, you know. I think the crux of the Canadian model, in a way, is, is value creation. So when it started in the 90s, interest rates were like close to 10%. And still, the 10% was not, not good enough at the time, and it had to be more. So there was a lot of pressure on the Canadians to, to really think carefully, like, how can we generate even more returns than you know, the 10% in interest rates? And I think all these years, the same mindset is still there. It's always about long-term value creation. So in our case, we do a lot internally. Uh, it's probably close to 80% that we do internally. Um, but we do use the, the strategic partners to really focus on that value creation, um, thinking about innovation, where can we go next? Um, and that is really important to us um, because you know, if you look at the liabilities, they're very long. Uh, we can, you know, we don't have to bother about liquidity issues or whatsoever. Um, so we have a very interesting starting point to work with strategic partners to really look at innovation and see, you know, where the value can be created. Absolutely. Well, let's go there next. Um, what are your best ideas as you look towards the future from an asset class perspective? What strategies seem interesting to you? Go ahead. Um, so it's, it's an interesting question because there's always a tendency to become very tactical and say like, oh, this year we're going to look at this. But that's not the mindset. We really have this very long-term uh, focus. Um, and there are a couple of things that, we, uh, that we're actually looking into. Um, one is more based on, on knowledge building and then we really think about longer-term trends. 
So what kind of trends are out there that might impact the business models we invest in today? So you have to think about AI, obviously, uh, quantum computing, uh, digital assets, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We look into that and see, like, is there an opportunity to really start building up that, that, you know, these assets? But more importantly, gain the knowledge related to these assets, like how is that going to impact the, uh, the existing uh, business models we invest in? The other part is, from a more total fund perspective, as I said, we're always looking for something new. Can we optimize this, this total fund? Uh, that is more challenging, because if it were easy, I'm sure that most institutional investors would have figured it out. Um, but actually, there isn't that much out there. So the one thing that we really um, focus on right now is more insurance-related investments, because you could argue like a lot of insurance products are not GDP-related like many other asset classes. So that could be a true diversifier. But the challenge that we have then is like, is it diversifying enough to actually give up parts of the existing portfolio? But that is a clear example where we, where we look into um, currently for, for the years to come. Okay. Brandon, are those themes on trend with what you're looking at from an external manager uh, program? Very much, very much. I mean, I think it, just getting on the innovation theme, it's important um, to follow those themes just simply from a risk management standpoint because you know markets are developing all the time and you really need to understand some of this just to mitigate any risks or un unforeseen events or things that are going to affect your portfolio so i do echo um the the theme of innovation and then what i would also add is you know for us we're really taking the approach, uh, and I've always taken the approach that, you know, a well-built portfolio, um, you know, we're, we're not trying to sort of lean into too much or lean out of too much. We want just a very solid portfolio construction on our portfolio so that we're resilient across all types of cycles. And so that's sort of the base that we're working with. But within that, at least in, you know, in, in the portfolios that I'm looking at, it's a lot of um, long-only equity as well as, or beta one equity, as well as absolute return. And within that, we're just making sure that we've got um, a variety of styles. We're pretty enthusiastic about the opportunity set, just given the fact that there's a lot of um, volatility, enough volatility in the market, but not too much volatility. There's um, a lot of alpha opportunity there. So we are definitely looking at all, very excited about lots of different types of strategies, like relative value strategies, macro strategies, just given so much is happening in the market, and credit strategies as well, just given where rates are. So there's some pretty exciting opportunities in this market that we definitely want to take advantage of within this total portfolio construction kind of approach. Yeah. And can you elaborate um, exactly what you're demanding managers consider from an innovation implementation perspective and, and what you'd like to see from them with AI and, and how they're considering that in portfolio construction? Sure. So I think that, you know, one of the things we've learned is if they're not thinking about AI, that's going to be a problem because, you know, everybody else is and their competition is. So if they're not doing it, they're just going to be behind the curve no matter what. So I think everyone should be thinking about AI and how it's going to affect their businesses or their investment strategies. So we are, um, I would say, just really closely monitoring to see their approaches, making sure they're sound, see how they compare with peers um, to make sure that we are still with the best in class managers who are thinking about those risks. Because if they don't, the alpha will degenerate in their strategies and it will be less appealing. Okay. Anita, as you're building out your external manager program, what themes are of most note to you? Uh, like I said, I think the well, I, I'll start by saying I think beta will be challenged. So I think that's where external managers can actually add value to our overall portfolio allocation. So I think we really are looking for, within my program, for kind of cash plus four is kind of the, the hurdle we're looking at. Uh, and I think we can do that. I think, like I said, beta, I think it could possibly be challenged. So I'd look at relative value. Uh, I think there's good opportunities with potential dislocations. You can see it kind of under the surface in a lot of markets. Um, last year, for example, the NASDAQ 100 was up, I don't know, 50%, and Russell was up only like 20. So that's a big dis dispersion. China was probably down a, or underperformed Nikkei by probably 50% as well last year. So there's opportunities to make substantial money if you can position yourself rightly. Uh, I think uh, multi-strats are also a very good area to be. They, they were great before, uh, not to say that they can't still be great, but I think the war on talent and the fees pass through probably make them good going forward rather than great. Uh, that would be my opinion. Uh, and if I was to pick something else, I'd say 
I know there's a lot of focus on credit, particularly private credit uh, lending. Uh, I think there is value there, but I probably see the relative, uh, a relative opportunity in equities being a little bit higher in terms of risk return profile. So that's where I would kind of focus. Edward, we just uh, had a conversation this morning on uh, private credit as part of the Global Investor Board. Any <laughs> thoughts on whether we are in a golden age of private credit, or are there? <laughs> that's <your> not fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was here yesterday, and I was listening to, to all the different people on stage talking about private debt. Uh, I think there was you know, a very positive undertone. Like, guys, this is, this is really interesting. Your opportunities are here. You get rewarded quite well. And in all fairness, it doesn't really reflect the way we speak about it internally when we talk about the total fund and all the different uh, asset classes. So, yeah, there might be opportunities. I, I can understand that, especially one of the, 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 the panelists said, like, well, there's not enough competition, which is quite telling. Like, okay, the banks are apparently not leaving this, this market space, and there's not enough capital to replace that. But at the same time, I feel like, gosh, it has to come from somewhere. If the private debt is so re uh, rewarding right now, it has to come from somewhere. So there's another asset class like equity um, that is paying the price for it. So I'm not sure whether this is sustainable, to be honest. Um, and the statement like, gosh, we had 10 year over an equity uh, period, and now we go into this 10 year credit uh, uh, period. Um, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Uh, Time will tell. And I know digital assets is, of course, well represented here. Anyone uh, looking at that space, either directly or through external managers or on the private equity side? Uh, well, uh, I'll say uh, on the public market side, it's not really an area of focus for us uh, at, at current time. It, it might be in the future, but as of right now, no. And I would just chime in and say, um, you know, we're not doing, we don't have an active program in that, even though I did in my prior job, but we don't have that in AIMCO, but I think it is still important to understand the trends happening in that market and the risks, you know, of that market so that if your managers or partners do have it, you're kind of understanding if they're doing it in an, ad in the, an appropriate way. So, so we're certainly staying um, in tune with what's happening in that market and, and, and understanding it um, because I think that asset class will emerge little by little over time and um, you'll want to understand it. Mm. Okay. We've got a few minutes left. Maybe we turn our vision beyond uh, asset allocation ideas to the future of the model itself and whether um, the scalability and the complexity and uh, the continued first mover advantage into new and innovative strategies and, and continued use of private markets will be able to continue to be a successful model. So, uh, Puneet, would love to hear from you first. Where do you see the Canadian model evolving from here? It's a, it's a, very, it's a very tough question. I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'll answer it exactly, but I think the challenge for Ontario teachers is just the, I'll just give you a bit of background. I, I was at Ontario Teachers 20 plus years ago, and I, I returned recently. Um, but the scale is so much different. Uh, it was roughly 40, 50 billion dollars 25 years ago, and now it's 250 billion dollars. So the scale is, is a big thing to manage. So can we invest appropriately given our scale in a robust way, uh, such that we have a well-defined portfolio and we're meeting our obligations to our pensioners? Um, so the investments have to really be able to move the needle uh, and we really have to have it like an eye forward in terms of what the macro environment will look like. Inflation is a big concern, so how are we addressing that? Uh, I think the market environment is such that we've moved from, rates are higher now, but I think a lot of investors hadn't seen kind of high rate environment uh, in their careers, or a lot of the younger traders might not have, so I think it's something to adjust to, uh, and it's something that we'll probably have to figure out the implications as they kind of roll out into various asset classes in different forms. Maybe there's cracks under the, uh, under the surface that might appear, so we always have to be ready to that. I think to, to that effect, I'll, I'll also say it, it always does pay to kind of cover your tail um, exposures, because the ability to cut off your negative tail over the long term can generate compounded returns in your favor for a long period of time. Uh, something to be mindful of. Okay. Brandon? So I'm pretty optimistic about the Canadian model, and I think it will continue to 
endure, and I think it will continue to evolve from here. And if I had to think of a couple of ways that it would evolve, I do think this total portfolio approach concept is going to evolve more. I mean, the, these organizations are bigger, and they have been subject to kind of people working in silos over history. I mean, they're really trying to evolve from that place. And I think there's a lot of that takes a lot of work and time and coordination across teams. And I think we'll just get better and better at that. Um, as we get used to having to think about you know, our asset allocation on a relative basis. So I think that, that, that that's going to get fine-tuned and evolve quite a bit. I also am a big, I think you're going to see more use of these strategic relationships. I do think the managers that we work with want to provide that. They see that as their value add, and I think people will also get better at, at doing that. Um, and then I might echo, well, I might just build on your point about scale. If we think about some of the risks, I think that if you get, you know, they are successful, so they are growing and doing well and getting bigger. And there is a bit of a sweet spot on how you manage your portfolio. If it gets too big, you know, you do miss some really interesting niche or opportunities that can be a lot, add a lot of value add um, to your portfolio. At the same time, that scale is very helpful in getting fee benefits and other benefits. So, you know, Hopefully, we can all sort of maintain that sweet spot um, where we're not so big that we can't really do what we want and the best thing for the, the, the clients. Um, but um, ideally, we sort of keep that, that spot. Final word to you, Edward. So there are a couple of things um, looking forward and, and just taking you one step back. Um, I think the Canadians were, like you said, uh, Claire, the, the early movers in, in private markets. Um, and if you're cynical, you could argue like, well, that was why they, re you know, they, they generated the, uh, the good returns, but that advantage is gone. But what you shouldn't forget is because of the internal management, those teams running those private assets have become more sophisticated. They really know their markets now and they can actually move uh, towards more complex deals. Um, and what it requires is the flexibility again to really not be, be boxed in in a certain asset class, but have the flexibility to really look for where these opportunities sit. And that's also where the strategic partners come in. Like we can actually work with them, really go into the space where the traditional or the standard manager is not going. So I think going forward, that's still a, a source of value for the Canadian model. Um, but on a more critical note, there are two things I think the Canadian model should adjust. Um, first of all, it's fundamentally, it's a very fundamental model. It's really about business cases. I think we really have to beef up the use of technology in the, in the Canadian model as well. I mean, this is a trend you cannot uh, miss out on. So in general, I don't think the Maple 8 is that sophisticated in, in, when it comes down to technology. And the other thing is long-term risk management. I think we really have to step away from the traditional way of, of looking at risk as market risk. For the Maple 8, that is not the big driver. The, the risk is really linked to the, the liability, so it's you know, potential deficits. It's a long-term uh, risk. So if market, if market volatility spikes, we shouldn't get nervous at all, because that's not what really impacts basically our mission. Um, but if you think about it like, you know, what is out there that helps you in terms of long-term risk management, it's still very limited. So that's an area where we really need to, uh, to evolve. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Edward, Brandon, and Puneet. Uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you.